Well, this is a very special night tonight. And I'm going to invite Christy, if you'd like to come up now, sweetheart, uh, as we get ready to ordain. Not what uh, Ethan Holden last Sunday morning talked about. Uh, we, uh, Jimmy and Kay are going to be ordinated, uh, which I thought was a beautiful uh, slip. And it reminded me, actually, before I moved down to Melbourne, I was on a ministry team of a church in Sydney. And uh, we had a new pastor coming in and our assistant pastor made the announcement that next week Gary was going to be induced. <laughs> I, he meant inducted. So that, Ethan's little slip reminded me of that. It was beautiful. So, sweetheart, you're going to tell us the, the journey to ordination? Yes, and I just realised I've left my mic down there. It doesn't matter. I can use yours. Thank you. So um, Kay and Luke have gone through uh, various... Uh, different hoops, so to speak. Um, with ordination, it's about competency, it's about character, and it's about call. It's not just uh, you could do a PhD and it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be called to ordination. Uh, the thing is that it's important that people are not only um, feel called, but they're also equipped. And often too, too often in the ministry, people really struggle and suffer. And that's because they haven't been properly trained and they haven't gone through the necessary challenges and the necessary life transformation. You know, some people say, well, you know, you can be in the ministry without being ordained. And yes, you can. But uh, the training is very, very important. And also, the, uh, as I say, the life transformation is important. So Jimmy um, and Kay have both studied They've both graduated with their degree, uh, their, ba their bachelor degree, and they've also done a postgraduate certificate uh, as well in uh, pastoral supervision. Uh, they have pushed themselves through all of that during COVID, and the board have been praying for them, and they've uh, also applied themselves to different things that they've been asked to do as they have been uh, formed and as they have, you know, come into, I guess, they've been discipled. And I don't think there's two people that Rob and I could say that have been as transformed as these two people uh, in the time that, uh, that they've been with us. And it's just, it's such a, an exciting time, you know. Uh, it, it's a bit like a wedding. An ordination is a bit like a wedding. And when you take it seriously, uh, it has an impact. And these guys have taken this seriously. And we're all so excited and so uh, so blessed for them. So we are, without further ado, we're about to start their ordination. We are. Well, yeah. You, you've started it. I've started it. You have indeed. Beautiful. And so uh, Kay Braywa and Jimmy Day have been on their probationary minister's certificates for the past two years. It's like wearing your pea plates. Uh, the board of Bayside Church has now invited them for ordination. They've accepted the invitation, and so it's our privilege to ordain Kay and Jimmy this evening. The apostles appointed or ordained pastoral teams throughout the New Testament scriptures to lead local churches Paul regularly ordained pastors for the churches he planted. He and Barnabas directed the appointment of ordination of elders in each church in Galatia. That's in Acts 14.23. He instructed Titus to appoint elders in every town in Crete. That's in Titus 1.5. Titus himself had been ordained earlier when he was chosen by the churches. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 19. It is God who ordains or rather calls the person. Ordination, in ordination, the church simply recognises that call. The Greek word for ordain literally means to stretch forth the hands. And so later in the service, we will lay hands on Kay and Jimmy and pray for them to ordain them for the ministry God has called them to. But before we get to that, we know that you would love to hear from both of them. And so we have invited Kay and then Jimmy to share with you tonight something of the journey that has brought them to this place tonight. And so put your hands together and welcome Kay as she comes. On behalf, on behalf of Jimmy and I, we'd just like to say, you know, thank you so much for each one of you for coming and sharing your support with us this evening. 
I really just want to share with you just a little minute of my journey here. And um, the verse that comes to mind for me is Jeremiah 29, 11, which says, I know the plans for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And I'm so thankful to my Heavenly Father. You know, I was brought up in a um, Christian home or Christian values. But my mum would often say to me as a little girl, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my answer would always be, I want to be a teacher. I don't think the word pastor or minister was even in my vocab, except for when I was maybe eating spaghetti. And then it was spelt slightly differently. But I had um, had a faith in the Lord when I turned 15. And I had an amazing maths teacher who was like my big sister. And she discipled me and took me on a journey for two years until I came to Australia when I was 17. And I remember walking around the streets in Camberwell, feeling just so lost. Like here I am in a country that speaks the same English as New Zealand, and yet I don't know anybody. And so when we settled in Cheltenham, I dragged my poor mum, who wasn't a Christian and isn't a churchgoer, to Mentone Baptist Church just down the road from here. And I'm so thankful for Mentone Baptists because they taught me how to read the Bible, have a love for the Word. They taught me how to have a servant heart. And they also gave me my husband, Luke, (laughs) which is a good thing. We've been married 30 years in November and I met Luke when we were 18. And um, we've always done ministry together. And it was my passion for ministry that saw me I think right at the very beginning, we worked with street kids in Dingley, and that saw me have a real passion of going into ministry and leading me to where I am today. We moved to Bayside Church in uh, Christmas 2003, and in 2005, Luke and I were both sitting in the same service. Luke was on the sound desk, and I was in the congregation, and where the Lord gave both of us a word, and I walked out, and I said, I got a word from the Lord today, and Luke said, that's interesting, so did I. And I said, well, you go first. And was, you know, banter backwards and forwards, as we do. And Luke said, well, the Lord said that I would be working one day at Bayside Church. And I said, well, that's really interesting because I got exactly the same word. Let's see what happens. Well, fast forward to 2012 and I came on to staff at Bayside Church. And while I do get paid here, Luke's bank account in heaven is pretty healthy as well. <laughs> I mean, he volunteers here so much of his time that I would almost say both of us do actually work here. But 2012, January 2012, I was driving, we live not too far from here, and I used to work in Camberwell at the time. I was driving down Warrigal Road to get to Camberwell, drove past the church. When I hit South Road, the Lord said to me, and it was always an audible voice, You won't be working at New Zealand Steel by the end of this year. And because I never talk back, and my mum can attend to that, can't you, mum? I turned around to the Lord and said, well, that's great. But I haven't ever had a resume. I never had a resume when I got the job at New Zealand Steel, where I had been working for 23 years, and I don't have a resume now. So you know what, Lord, if you don't want me working here or at New Zealand Steel, you open up the doors and you make it happen. Eight weeks later... I was working at Bayside Church, and I've never looked back. But what I want to share with you now is my transformational journey. Pastor Christy shared just a minute ago that, you know, it is an inward journey, and I can feel that I'm definitely not the same person that I was when I started here in 2012. And the verse I want to share is Romans 12 2, and it says, Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. Now, part of the journey here um, is doing your Christian Worker Certificate 1. And on that journey, I was able to read a book from Phil Pringle called You, The Leader. And I want to refer to a passage out of this tonight for the rest of um, my sharing time because this passage really impacted me back in 2015 when I started the journey of ordination 
And it was brought back to my remembrance probably about four weeks ago. And when I was reading it, it was like, wow, this has really been the inward transformation that I have been on. And Phil Scouts and he says, you know, it's more difficult for deep changes to take place once we're in leadership. It is far better that these inward workings take place before the day of our release to the public. And so how does this transformation work? Well, first the potter, which is Jesus, repeatedly forces a shapeless lump of clay, which is me, through a screen to remove bits of stone, grass, weeds, air bubbles. The beginning of the call of God is all about removing those things in us that are hindering our growth. These same issues, if not dealt with, will damage our lives in later years. We must deal with them early on. Sometimes we think we can get away with a few air bubbles or blades of grass and still succeed in the ministry. And you know, for a while we probably can. However, the damage from this debris will only increase as our load becomes heavier and we will eventually collapse under its weight. Now, back in 2013, I'd been on staff for a year and we decided as a family to go to Bali on a holiday. And we were blessed to have a two or three day crossover with Pastor Christy at the time, who was doing ministry in Karabakan Prison. And I remember Pastor Christy saying to me, you know, I don't know you that well, but I see your heart for ministry. I see your heart for pastoral care. However, before we can actually get you there, there are a few sharp edges in your life that kind of need to be a bit curved. And I remember going to Luke going, what on earth? <laughs> I don't have sharp, cur- sharp edges. I'm black and white. I'm all good. Come on, what's the problem here? Yeah, I'm just so thankful for Pastor Christine and your discernment. And uh, I was so not ready <laughs> back then like I thought I was. So thank you. So after the potter removes the clay's impurities, it is then kneaded. The clay becomes softer and more malleable. And this is akin to the Holy Spirit softening our hearts to the Lord as He prepares us for moulding. The turning wheel is the next stop. The wheel goes round and round. And here is where we learn staying power. We were thought we were going to have amazing adventures But here we are, going to church, going home, going to church, going home. Or in my case, doing another event, going home, doing another event, going home. You see, I was in New Zealand Steel for 23 years and I looked after the computer system and I looked after sales and I had an amazing group of people who are here tonight and I consider them family. For me to move on to there, move on from New Zealand Steel, It was never going to be doing events, or so I thought. It was going to be going and doing connect groups. It was going to be going and doing pastoral care. And yet I was on this wheel for about three years, going round and round and round. And I remember one afternoon, I had enough. So I knocked on Pastor Sandra's door and I said, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm getting off the wheel. And she said to me at the time, you know what? That's your choice. And you can walk out the door now. However, I just want to say to you, if you do do that, I really believe you're going to be missing out on what the Lord has in store for you. And I remember driving to uh, pick up the kids from school, whinging the whole way, going, far out, Lord, can't they see, you know, what's their issue? What's their attitude? They've got such bad attitudes out there, you know, far out. (laughs) And hearing a small voice coming back to me going, Maybe it's your attitude. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think so, Lord. Absolutely not. <laughs> and he just, would, he just hammered it. Maybe you're the one that has to change the attitude. Remember those squares, those, those, no, they need to be rounded. And so being a good Christian, I went, all right, Lord, I'm going to put you to the test, as you do. I was a pretty stubborn person back then, wasn't I, Jill, hey? Yeah. And so I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to change my attitude And I'm going to see what doors you open and what doors you close. Later on that year, I was actually asked to do CW1. And that was the start of where I am today. And so those, those, you know, by listening to Pastor Sandra and maybe changing my attitude, 
because it was my attitude that needed changing, not those around me. I started going into pastoral care. I started going into connect groups. And my life radically has been on a journey ever since. But then water is poured all over us. You know, we're off that wheel and we go, oh, at last. We think this is my great moment. Release to the leadership position he's called me to. No, not yet. The Holy Spirit pours over us like water in such a way that we can be moulded further by the hand of God. His thumb presses deep into the centre. It's not on the outside, but it's in here. It's on the inside. And he goes to work on areas that no one else can see. As the thumb of the potter penetrates the centre, we feel the beginnings of, God, of being opened up as a vessel for God. And the hands of the potter gets firmer. More water is poured and he squeezes the clay and it rises. And even while God is squeezing, we grow taller, gaining that profile that we wanted, finding our shape. However, if we've held on to one of those small stones or weeds, here is where it's found out. As the clay walls grow thinner, the hidden lumps warp the clay in the potter's hands. And a hard stone cuts right through the wall of that rising pot and the shape that was forming is ruined. The stone must be found and dug out. We cannot afford any hard attitudes, big or small, and we cannot allow this debris to remain in our lives. You know, another thing that Pastor Christy introduced to the team was the Enneagram, which is a personality topology and has revolutionised our office. It's revolutionised me as a person. I can actually see now why I get offended the way I do, how I react to different things and why I do the things I do. But more importantly... It's allowed me to walk the journey with others in such a gentle way, understanding who they are and how to minister to them, not from what, how I want to minister, but how they actually need to be ministered to, to be able to, be, you know, to receive that ministry. And so I, I just love the Enneagram and that Enneagram helped me again to start smoothing those corners that needed to be smoothed. So when the impurities are revealed, they're removed and the clay is squashed back into a shapeless lump. The potter begins again. Once more water from above is poured out, the firm pressure and squeezing of the potter begins again. We look a lot more like we should. We stand tall on the wheel and we actually look like a vessel for God. And then we feel movement. The spatula slides under us and we're on the move. Finally, we're going somewhere. We're moving. And the potter cries, carries us towards a quiet corner of the room. And we say, no, not that door. We want to go over there. But we're carried to what could only be described as a shelf. Oh, no, we cry. That's not what we want. We want to be out there doing the work. However, it's on the shelf we go. You see, we need to calm down and we need to dry out a little bit. Again, no big attitudes in the Lord's work. And time passes and again, it seems like forever. We doubt the call, wondering if God is ever going to use us. And then finally, we feel the move of God again in our lives. Yes, 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 we're moving. The door, Lord, you know, it's over there. And he says, we're not going over there. We're going over here. But that's the hot part of the room. What's it called? The kiln? I've always wondered what that place was. Oh, no. We're not going in there, Lord. No, no, it's too hot. I don't want to go in there. I want to go in, not that door now. I want to go in this one over here. And into the fire we go. We're fired into resilient vessels for God. You see, in the kiln, any cracks are discovered immediately. And it's here under the intense heat that God makes his decision to use us or not. We may think we are in charge, but we're not the one choosing whether we will do something for God. It is his kingdom. He chooses his servants. And it is in the fire that that happens. So finally, the firing is over. We're now tough, glazed and colourful. And when we emerge, though, we're not so keen on moving around and getting things done anymore. We've had all the personal ambition, 
burned right out of us. Impatience gives way to surrender. And we're actually happy for God to use anyone else but us. <laughs> we feel less qualified than ever for service to God. When we come out of the fire, this is just about the time the Lord begins to use us. He carries us from the room and we, his vessels, are filled. He fills us with living water for the thirsty, new wine for the despairing, oil of joy for the grieving and praise for the depressed. It is then that he commissions us to go. And church, I just want to say a huge thank you. It's an absolute honour and a privilege to be standing up here tonight. I never thought in 2012, roll on to 2023, that I would actually be here. So I just really want to give thanks to the board for inviting me to come to ordination. Um, you know, it is, it's an absolute privilege and I look forward to being a ordained pastor here at Bayside Church. I'd also like to thank, now Pastor Georgina cannot be here tonight because she is not very well, but Pastor Georgina back 20 years ago was my, my spiritual mum. She gave me my passion for Connect Group leadership and I'm forever thankful for that. I'm still passionate about Connect Groups here at Bayside. And she taught us how to pray and just how to, you know, walk alongside leaders in such a loving way. I'd like to thank Pastor Sandra. You're an amazing friend and manager inside the office and a friend outside of the office. I thank you that you believe in me and that you push me beyond what I actually want to do. You know, I can come up with a million excuses. The, the recent one being Pastor Rob coming up to me on Mother's Day or for the Mother's Day message and saying, hey, would you like to preach? And I went up to Sandra and I said, so Pastor Rob's asked me to preach on Mother's Day. Yeah, and what did you say? I said, well, I'm going to go away, think about it and pray. She said, enough praying, just go and tell him right now you're going to go and do it. <laughs> and I was like, I haven't prayed. You don't need to pray. You've already got a message, just do it. So I just, I just thank you for your belief in me and for giving me that, that nudge that I actually need. Pastor Robson Christie, what can I say? You know, we've been on a journey for the past 20 years and you are true friends. We love you absolutely dearly and your family as well. And I can't wait to see where the Lord takes Jimmy and myself in ordination. But it will certainly be here, lifting your arms up and um, walking alongside you with wherever the Lord wants you know, Bayside Church to head into the future. And last but not least, I'd love to thank my beautiful husband, and family. Luke, you've been with the journey for 33 years and um, I love you dearly. Um, you know, it hasn't been easy going through Bible college, working, you getting a new job and management and stuff like that, but you've always been there and you've always been there in ministry. Like, I think we've always done things together. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for just yeah, loving me as unconditionally as you do. And, um, yeah, let's uh, continue the journey for the next 30 years. And I just thank the Lord. I thank the Lord that he found me. Well, he knew me from before I was born. But I came to know him as my friend and my saviour at the age of 15. And I'm not too sure where I'd be standing today if I actually didn't know him. Um, you've heard my story from Mother's Day. And if you haven't, it's on YouTube. You can go and listen to it. But I am just forever thankful that he's held my hand that he's actually rubbed those sharp corners off and he has transformed me from the inside out. And it's such a blessing to be standing here. So thank you. That was so inspiring. And uh, I'm so encouraged to hear what you said. And it's been wonderful to watch that journey. And uh, as you said, may it continue. Um, right now, we're going, to go and we're going to hear from Jimmy. So let's put our hands together and welcome Jimmy Day as he comes. Uh, I will say I'm probably odds on to cry. So if you cry when... Uh, I've heard that when grown men cry, people typically cry. So uh, grab some tissues. Um, also get comfortable. My speech is 11 pages long. So uh, that's... that's that's only because it's in like giant text, so I can read it. It's only actually like four pages, so, uh, so we're all good. Um, where do I start? Uh, there's lots I want to say, um, 
but I'm not sure I have the words to adequately convey what I'm feeling. And I do apologise, I will be looking down a lot because emotion and wanting to say what I want to say. So just prefacing that now. Um, I'm incredibly humbled to be standing here tonight, having been invited to ordination and being able to take this step in my life and in my calling. For all my life, I've wanted to belong. Sure, I've had friends and been a part of sporting clubs, but it wasn't until I became a Christian at 18 that the notion of what it truly means to belong started to show itself. It was also the point at which I started a journey of understanding my identity and my purpose. And I imagine that all of us want to belong. We all want to know who we are and what we are supposed to do with our lives. And for me, I had lots of ideas of what I wanted to do when I grew up. I explored different things in my teens and when I started uni, I thought I knew what I wanted from my life. It was built around success and prestige um, and at times expectations from my family. And I don't say that last one as a negative. I love the fact that my family who are here tonight wanted what they thought was the best for me. And I wouldn't change my educational journey and trying three or four different uni degrees and accruing a hex debt and all of these things and trying it out while I figured out who I am and what I wanted to do. You know, my identity as a teenager was all around social pressures. I drank too much, I partied, wasn't a great person. Um, and I'm so in awe of what God has done and is doing and will continue to do in and through me. You know, at 17, if you told me that at 33, I'd be on a stage inside a church accepting the invitation to be a pastor, firstly, I'd be asking, what's a pastor? <laughs> and then when that was explained to me, uh, my second response would be, no thanks. Uh, church and God wasn't really my thing until God made himself impossible to ignore. I've always battled this feeling of not being good enough, of not having a place and of being unworthy of good things in my life. And one of the key things I've come to experience in my faith walk is that because of Jesus and my faith in him, I am worthy. It's, it's got nothing to do with who I am or what I've done. It's merely accepting this gift of love and grace that is the death and resurrection of Jesus. And it takes time to embrace that. And I can remember that Sunday morning at my, when I first started going to church, Torquay Christian Fellowship. It was, the, it was April the 6th, 2008. I was sitting in the congregation and there was this drama skit that happened. Now, if you've been around church for a long time, you've probably heard the song Everything and the skit that goes with it. That happened in church. And this skit encapsulated my struggles, the way in which I got caught up with the things of the world. So alcohol, girls, money, comparison negative thoughts, and I was at a low point in myself and figuring out who I was. And in that skit, Jesus then intervenes and rescues the person. And in that moment, I experienced the love of God for the first time. It was all consuming and something in me changed that day. I felt as if I was seen and not just seen, but was loved, valued and had a place. No strings attached. And the trajectory of my life changed that day. In Jesus, I found my worth as a man and simply as a human being. In Jesus, I am enough. In Jesus, I belong. I'm seen as family to the Lord of Lords and the God of all creation. But also, I belong in church community. And for me, this calling to ministry is about helping others find those same, same things. To find their place, to find their worth, to find their identity and their purpose in who they are created to be in the image of God. You know, I've navigated being an outcast most of my life. And so, you know, outcasts represent, <laughs> uh, you know, my walk as a Christian these past 15 plus years has seen trauma. It's seen people come in and out of my life. I've walked challenging situations, but the whole way through, because of God's goodness, his faithfulness and his love for me as his son. He has enabled 
and empowered me to persevere and come through these things a whole lot stronger than I could have ever foreseen. I have God to thank endlessly for me standing here today. And I'm so glad that God was patient with me, pursued me and allowed me to meet him where I was at. Without him, I'm not standing here today as a called, adopted, commissioned, redeemed, empowered son of God, being ordained as a minister with the distinct privilege and incredible responsibility that I do not take for granted to encourage, equip and train people in their faith journey. I'm privileged to be able to preach and teach God's word, to stand alongside people in prayer in some of the most challenging but also most joyful moments in their lives, to share communion, to baptise, to dedicate, to cry with, to celebrate and so much more with incredible church and group of people. And as I've gotten older, I've come to appreciate the moments in life and all that they entail. And from these moments, a legacy is born. And I look to many characters in the Bible for inspiration and to what their lives and legacies have meant to me. There's Peter, good old Peter, act act first, think second. There's a lot of Peter in me in that regard. What we see in Peter, beyond just the overeager, impulsive guy, is a man of loyalty, of strength, who is unafraid to wear his heart on his sleeve, is willing to be bold in his faith, and is okay apologising. And if I can be half the man Peter was, I'll be pretty happy. Then there's Joshua, a young man who walked with Moses, learning and growing in faith, and then stepping into leadership. He was strong and courageous. Those are things that I could put on but really wasn't. I wanted to be like Joshua, to be someone who is strong in faith and in their convictions, courageous in their protection and care for others, who didn't shirk responsibility and who wasn't driven by fear and comparison. I'm not altogether there yet, but I'm on the journey because of those promises that God spoke to Joshua. And at the end of his life, Joshua wrote the following, it was paraphrased. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And this is a legacy verse for me. As someone who didn't know God or Jesus growing up, I've committed to my household serving the Lord. And many of you know M's and my journey around having kids, desperately wanting that and not happening as we thought it would. But we are a family and we will serve the Lord and we'll use our home for that. In the, in the hope that anyone who visits our home can and will experience the love of God. And from there, I ponder what sort of legacy I want to leave. There's a couple of verses I'm just going to skip through. In John 14, chapter 12, Jesus says that because he is going to the Father, we will do even greater things than he did. And no matter how many times I talk about this verse, I'm energised, a little nervous and find it completely outrageous that I fit into that category. But bring it on. I want to be a man of radical and bold faith for people. In Acts 3.6, we see Peter and John pray for a man. Peter reaches out his hand and lifts him to his feet. This man was paralysed and in that moment he is healed. I want to be available to God to be used in a way that helps people be healed physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, in whatever way they need. And then there's Philippians 4, 4 to 13 and we read a statement written by a guy in chains in prison that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want to leave a legacy of faith, of being a light to people that sees them find healing, freedom and so much more through God's life because through Christ I can be content and at peace in every situation. And these are the things that God has instilled in me over the 15 plus years walking with him and you know the 10 plus years of study and being here at Bayside and wearing different hats and probably being at points where I think, oh, yeah, I'm ready, and then right at this minute feeling completely inadequate. (laughs) It's funny how that works. You know, I've been refined, many sharp edges shaved off, um, and it's, it's been an incredible opportunity to be able to learn, to grow, to fail, and then to learn and grow through that, to walk with people and to find myself, to find that something to live for. And so as I reflect on this journey to tonight, to my ordination, I realise that I am the legacy of many people who have sown their lives, their words and who they are 
and as such have helped shape me into the man I am today and the pastor that I hope to be. That legacy continues with me and all that is to come from this point. So I'm aware of time, so I will skip through this as quick as I can, but there are some poignant thank yous that I want to make to recognise. I start with my family. And mum and dad, I don't say this anywhere near as much as I should, but I love you and thank you. Thank you for always making things happen for us kids. I know we never had a lot, and you gave us the opportunities to be us, to learn, to have a good life. You always had our backs. And I can't imagine what it would have been like to parent me. Um, that would have been interesting. So thank you for sticking with me and encouraging me to pursue my dreams. I'm proud to be your son, and I hope I make you guys proud too. To my brother and sister, you're both all right. Seriously, though, thanks for encouraging me and allowing me to speak into your lives, to give advice, and knowing that I have your back. I love you both. <sighs> to my grandparents, this is where I'm going to go. <laughs> Richard and Beth, you have believed in me since day one. You have done everything you can to support me, to encourage me, and to help me see the good in myself. Thanks for being okay with my daily phone calls just to check in, um, for investing into my future and teaching me the importance of reading and books and all of that. You've been unwavering in your love for me and for always wanting the best for me and for helping me support the best footy team on the land. I'm a bit emotional because since 2020, my grandpa's had three major operations and they call him the miracle man at Geelong Hospital because... <laughs> So I'm thankful to God that you're both still here and we can share this together and I love you both. <laughs> oh. To Aaron and Dave, my two longest friends. They're the two of the best people I know. I don't know how I've ended up having the two of you as my friends, but I'm so priv privileged to have your friendship. We've had many debates, differences of opinion, but nothing has been more important through all of that than our friendship. You've taught me the importance and value of being true to yourself and not trying to be someone else. And so I'm grateful for you both and how you've encouraged me to not be closed-minded, to explore faith and spirituality and to be open to God doing things a little bit differently than what I might have pictured. And as you probably don't remember this night in 2009 when you got a lift up to talk me off a crisis point, it's one of the most transformative and important things in my life. And I'm here partly because of that. So thank you both for teaching me loyalty and unwavering friendship, even in the wake of my bad decisions. I have so much love, respect and gratitude for you both. To Steve and Tracy, where you guys are, words fail me. You both have gone above and beyond for Em and I, and I have so much love and appreciation for you both. The same can be said for Tom and Chris. And Steve, my spiritual dad, bro, I'm privileged to call you a friend. I'm privileged to serve alongside you and to learn from you. I'm incredibly thankful for all the hard conversations we've had, the corrections you've brought, and for allowing me to vent. You've taught me so much about being a Christian man, a good husband, and a good leader. I hope I can be like you when I grow up. Love you, bro. <laughs> to the boys. Yeah, the boys. You know who you are. I don't need to name all the names. I have this great group of guys that I get to journey with who I call mates. I don't tell most of you how much I value your friendship, your questions, and your willingness to embrace this dorky bookworm from Geelong. You all inspire me in different ways, and my life is so much richer for doing this journey with you. To the family I've chosen which includes but isn't limited to people like Blair, Donnell, Will, Grace, Carlos, Emma, Kate and Liam and Ethan. You are some of my favourite people and I love you all dearly. I don't share my emotions much and I know I can often be grumpy or challenging because I'm basic in terms of my food preferences and <laughs> making decisions. I eat the same thing every day. But each of you has shaped my faith, how I interact with people, how I lead and so much more. My life is so much richer for having you in it. You've, you've helped me see beyond my limited perspectives and taught me to see the best in people at all times. And so the best I can do 
where you guys are is say thank you. Over the past nine and a half years or so, I've been able to work alongside some of the most remarkable people. They are kind, compassionate, authentic, they dream, they have fun, and they have made space for my eccentricities and constant questions and challenging everything. This staff team is like a family, and there are many thank yous for people past and present I need to make, and I'll do those in my own time. To the team as a whole, thank you for constantly inspiring me in my faith, challenging me to choose grace and kindness over grudge holding and judgment and for trusting and believing in me. You may come into work each day a joy. Thank you to our church board for believing in my calling and in who I am. I'm honoured that you think I'm ready for this step. Thank you for your wisdom, faithfulness and constant encouragement. To Pastor Robin Christie. I'm proud to be on your team and to serve under you. Thank you for believing in me, for walking with me, for teaching me, mentoring me, and being actively engaged with my life and ministry training. I remember at a young adults conference in or camp in 2015, I was talking about ministry and Pastor Rob said, trust me with your calling. Well, this is eight years of doing that and we get to this point. I'm so grateful for every opportunity you have given me to teach God's word to invest into people, to stretch myself and for pushing me outside of my comfort zone. My faith is stronger. My Bible knowledge is broader because of you both. You've believed in this young bloke from day one and allowed me the grace and space to process and to grow. Thank you for being transparent and real, for letting me into your lives and showing what it means to be a leader with integrity and character. I love you both and it's a privilege to be able to serve under and beside you. And M, I'm constantly inspired by you. I love you and you are, I know you are my number one fan. And church, without M, the wisdom she brings me, the telling me to finish my sermons at the natural end point, not talk for another five minutes. <laughs> without M, I'm not the man or the pastor that I am today and will be in the future. You are the most encouraging person I know and I learn from you all the time, even if I don't tell you that especially from how, in how to worship and to just be. We all have the ability to leave a legacy and it's worth considering what legacy you want to leave. Through God, we are given identity and purpose and something to live for. Seeing people experience hope and joy even through life's challenges. You know, thankfully God sees in us what we don't see in ourselves. So God, I'm thank you. I thank you for giving me the opportunity and responsibility to minister to your people and to be involved in helping them become more like you. I commit to doing all I can to serve you, Lord God, and to my church family to serve you for as long as you'll have me and as long as God wants me to do this. What I do and who I am is my calling. You know, God has created each of us in his image for a purpose. And I encourage you to let him in and allow him to restore hope, faith and joy where it may be missing. Because in him we find belonging. So thank you, church, for supporting me in this journey to ordination. I'm humbled by this opportunity and my life is richer for all of you being a part of it. Be blessed. Wow, magnificent words. Is there a dry eye in the house? No, I think not. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to move this. Yeah. So we can actually see. We're very far away from them. We are coming closer, coming closer. (laughs) All right, so we get to the official part of our ordination. We know that long ago you both began to weigh and ponder your call to Christian ministry and that you are entirely determined by the grace of God to devote yourselves wholly to his service so that as you daily follow the rule and teaching of our Lord and grow into his likeness, God may sanctify the lives of all with whom you have to do. And now, so that we may know your mind and purpose, You must make the declarations we put to you, which I am told you have memorised. Is that correct? 
All right, let me prompt you, okay? <laughs> so the first one is, I do so accept them. All right? Do you accept the Holy Scriptures as revealing everything necessary for eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? Okay, and you know the other one? This, this, uh, by the help of God, I will, okay? Will you be diligent in prayer, reading Holy Scripture, and all studies that will deepen your faith and prepare you to bear witness to the truth of the gospel? Will you lead Christ's people in proclaiming his glorious gospel so that the good news of salvation may be heard everywhere? Will you, knowing yourself to be reconciled to God in Christ, strive to be an instrument of God's peace in the church and the world? By the help of God, I will. Will you work with your fellow servants in the gospel for the sake of the kingdom of God? By the help of God, I will. Will you accept and minister the discipline of this church and respect the authority duly exercised within it? In the strength of the Holy Spirit, will you continually stir up the gift of God in you to make Christ known among all you serve? By the help of God, now I'd like the congregation, if you would please, would you stand? So I'm going to ask you two things. And, uh, and the first answer is we do. And the second answer is we will. Okay, so we do and then we will. And so, family and friends, you have heard how great the charge that Kay and Jimmy are ready to undertake. And you have listened to their declarations. Do you now support them in being ordained? And the second one is we will. Will you continually pray for them and uphold and encourage them in their ministry? Thank you. Thank you for that exuberance from Emma as well. You may be seated. Thank you. And so in the name of our Lord, we bid you remember the greatness of the trust that is now to be committed to your charge. Remember always with thanksgiving that the treasure to be entrusted to you is Christ's flock, bought by the shedding of his blood on the cross. To him you will render account of your stewardship of his people. You cannot bear the weight of his calling, of this calling in your own strength, but only by the grace and the power of God. Pray that your heart may be enlarged daily, your understanding of the scriptures enlightened, and that you pray earnestly for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to pray for them right now, and I'd like to invite the board and ordained pastors on our team, if you would come now, please, and gather around Jimmy and Kay, as we lay hands upon them. A couple of people to help Alice. That's wonderful. God bless you, Alice. For those of you who don't know, Pastor Alice Whitteson is 93 and still serving Jesus. Yeah. And dearly loved by this church, ordained many years ago many years. I invite you to stand again, church, if you would, please. You might like to stretch your hands out toward Jimmy and Kay and let us pray. We praise and glorify you, almighty Father, because of in your infinite love, you have formed throughout the world a holy people for your possession, a royal priesthood, a universal church. We praise and glorify you because you have given us your only Son, Jesus Christ, the image of your eternal and invisible glory, the firstborn of all creation and the head of the church. We praise and glorify you that by the death of Jesus on the cross, Jesus has overcome death and that having ascended into heaven, he has given his gifts abundantly to equip your holy people for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And now we thank you for calling these your servants, whom we ordain in your name, to share as ministers in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the apostle and high priest of our faith and the shepherd of our souls. Therefore, Father, through Christ our Lord we pray, 
Send down the Holy Spirit on your servants for the office and work of pastors in your church. Through your Spirit, Heavenly Father, give these your servants grace and power to proclaim the gospel of your salvation and minister the gifts of the new covenant. Renew them in holiness and give them wisdom and discipline to work faithfully with those committed to their charge. In union with their fellow servants in Christ, may they reconcile what is divided, heal what is wounded and restore what is lost. May they declare your blessings to your people. May they proclaim Christ's victory over the powers of darkness and point to forgiveness in Christ's name, those who turn to him in faith. So shall a people made whole in Christ offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to you, our God and Father, to whom with the Son and the Holy Spirit belong glory and honour, worship and praise, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Please be seated. We have a, a couple of other things that we would like to do um, before we end today. And the first is the giving of a Bible to both Kay and to Jimmy once they have finished being hugged. <laughs> We're a very huggy church, by the way. If you haven't noticed, we, we hug anything that moves and if it doesn't move, we'll hug it till it does. No, Jimmy wasn't a hugger, but he sure is now. <laughs> Converted. <laughs> Wonderful. So we have Bibles for both of you. So receive this book as a sign of the authority that God has given you this day to preach the gospel of Christ. Amen. And now we're going to present stoles. And so I'll hand to Christy for the uh, description of those stoles. So with um, our stalls, um, often in Pentecostal churches, we don't have any form of anything that has anything to do with ritual or, or ceremony or anything like that. And we've lost a lot with that. And uh, we have decided that part of our culture will be to do that. And so with the stalls, these um, are, uh, they're, they're basically just symbols of the fact that we have been set apart. And each one of the ordinance tonight chose uh, specific symbols to go on their stalls. So K stall features two symbols. It's the Star of David which uh, and hands, dove and light rays. The Star of David, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans to give you a future filled with hope. And Kay has chosen the Messianic cross to honour the integration of her Jewish heritage and Christian faith. Her grandparents were Messianic Jews who prayed for each of their grandchildren from the day they were born to come to know Jesus as their friend and saviour. The Star of David is centred in the middle of the Messianic cross, is full of Jewish history. The star, also known as the Shield of David, is a six-sided star that symbolises how God protects us from all six directions, north, south, east, north, south, east, west, up and down. It is made from two triangles, one pointing up to God to represent good deeds and one pointing down to express God's holiness flowing down towards earth. And the cross represents that Jesus, the Son of God, was crucified on a cross and resurrected three days later to forgive people of their sins. And then there's the hands and the dove and the light rays. And the scripture that, um, that, that represents that is Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit, with the peace that binds us. Kay has chosen this combination as a constant reminder of the calling she has received. The hands symbolize humility as they used, are they used to surrender everything to God. The dove and rays represent gentleness and hope as she ministers to others with love. Kay has chosen blue as her favorite color and its biblical meaning is trust, loyalty, hope and hope 
which are values that she lives by. by. Inside the stole, there are special dates. The date, 15th of March, 1987, that she gave her heart to the Lord. The 20th of November, 1993, which is her wedding anniversary. If you ever forget it, look, just run and check in the stole. <laughs> the 8th of April, 1997, when Kyle was born. And then the 20th of June, 1999, when Reese was born. And then today, the 5th of August, 2023. So we're just about to present her stole to her now. Jimmy Stoll, um, the scripture that he has is 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The color he has chosen is purple, for royalty, and the white, which symbolizes light and completion. He also has a dove with fire, and the Holy Spirit, which represents the Holy Spirit and the presence of God. The yellow and orange flames represent purification, the fire of God, deliverance, and passionate praise. He also has chosen a cross and an anchor combination, which is faith and hope, the faith and hope of our salvation and the anchor of his soul. At the back of it, the neck of his, he has a love heart with a cross inside, which represents God's love for his people. And the dates inside his are his salvation date, which is the 6th of April, 2008, his baptism date, the 30th of September, 2009, the wedding anniversary, the 5th of October, 2014, and of course, today, the 5th of August, 2023. Jimmy hasn't seen his stove yet. We did check it to make sure it was okay. Um, and we're just about to present it to him now. He's not, he's not ready to look at it yet. <laughs> Now, we're keeping Sandra busy tonight. We have a gift for each of you. I invite you all to stand with us. And church family and friends and family of Jimmy and Kay, I present to you Pastor Kay Brewer and Pastor Jimmy Day. Awesome. Beautiful. 